righty. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. It is March. March. My word, March is... Man, this year's gone pretty fast. But February always goes pretty quick. So a couple good things about it being March. First of all, it means for many of you, warmer weather is on the way. Uh, a few parts of the South are experiencing warmer weather now. Um, two weeks of daylight savings time, which I know, I know. We lose an hour, which is not great, but we get our light back, which is great. Talk to your representative. This is something I think the country could come together in unity on. Let's make daylight saving time permanent. That's when I get political. That's something I can talk about. Who's against it? Big conglomerate anti-time. Yeah, I'm just, I feel like, I feel like we should do this. Okay. Um, but anyway, so that's happening. Um, and, and I think, I think it's four weeks from today. Or it's three weeks. Might be three weeks. That sounds more likely. Spring Spectacular. Is it three weeks or four weeks? I think it's three. Yeah, you think I would know that. Three times 721, so would it be the 22nd? Is that when it starts? It's not the last week of the month we're doing it, so. You know we should know this better. <laughs> Spring Spectacular is coming. <laughs> so, all right. Um, if I move my head here, you can see Umbravia, and that's important to talk about because this show is sponsored by Pandasaurus Games, and we have a contest for Umbravia. Now, before we start talking about this contest, let me explain something. Every week we do a contest here on Board Game Breakfast. Every contest is different. So if you entered the contest for Umbravia last week, you can also enter it for this week and the week before. Well, those contests are over. But what I mean is you can always enter a contest. If it has a different subject line keyword, it is a different contest, which means a lot more chances for people to win. We're going to be playing Umbravia tomorrow live here on our channel, so you can see how it plays. But we have three copies of this for people in USA, Canada, or Australia. All you need to do is email us at contest at dicetower.com. And um, you need to, uh, in the subject line, put the word thorns. And uh, in the body, send us your address and answer this question. What color is not one of the player colors? Red, blue, yellow, green, or purple? I don't even know the answer to that because I don't remember what the colors are. But if you watch our playthrough tomorrow, you'll know the answer. But you can also go online. All righty. Well, that is... I think all the intro stuff that I have, we got other things going on, obviously. Um, life is changing at a pace every day all over the place, but we're going to keep moving. We got a contributor, then I'll be back in just a bit. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University. When you play board games, do you record it to an app or, I don't know, in Tarrant's case, notebook? I did have a notebook for a little while, uh, just to keep track of of what we played. I think I kept track of winners, um, just for interest sake. I always lost that interest though. <laughs> After a few months, Tarrant lost the interest. Now, I personally don't put anything. I know a lot of people do. I feel like there's more pressure to win somehow, if you put it there. Sometimes I just want to play games for fun. I just want to tried or I mean we um, we've got a lot of prototypes so you know obviously uh, some of them are not even on that that thing you know unless if you create it I don't know how that works really but I want to know let us know do you use that do you find that useful if you do why do you do you like it or just you know in a matter of stats or whatever reason you you have there or if you like me you don't because you don't want to you know, feel pressured to win if you score win or you just want to, you know, you probably just want to write down what you play but not the score. So I believe there are variations of that. Of that. Mm -hmm. So let us know, maybe we will get convinced to use it if um, you found it really useful. So that's it. We are on Meeple University on YouTube and also on the Dice Tower. See you next time. Hi everybody! Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany from Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today we're talking about Kanban EV. This is a, I guess, a re-implementation or a, a sequel to the game Kanban. This time we're talking about electronic vehicles. What you're doing is you are building and designing these car parts. You're going to test them out and install them on these cars, maybe upgrade them, uh, and ultimately trying to get the most victory points. But you're trying to work through this, you know, this 
factory where you're doing all these different things with these car parts. You've got a supervisor over your shoulder, and she is mean. If you choose her to be mean. Which, why wouldn't you? Which we did. <laughs> <laughs> we did. Every guy. <laughs> yeah, um, this game was a lot of fun, and I enjoyed playing it. However, there was a huge learning curve for me just with, with the, the weight of games I typically play. Once I learned it, I totally had it, but the first time it was, like, really, really rough. My brother may have yelled at me. Just putting that out Full there. Full volume, just absolutely screaming. He doesn't watch this, so I can call him out here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt about it. This is a heavy game. But for a heavy game, most, you know, euro -y style games have really kind of crummy artwork and components a lot of time, from my experience. But, my goodness, this one, look at this box art. It's amazing. Uh, and all the way through the game, all the components were, were top-notch. The, the board art, everything was just, was just really sleek and modern and cool. And it scaled really well in all player counts as well, and that is just a huge plus for me. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching us. You can find us on YouTube or Facebook. We are Ryan and Bethany, Board Game Reviews. Everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany. Hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, Bye everybody. Guys. Speaking of Kanban, you've been all wanting me to play that for a long time and review it. Well, good news, a review's going up today. Uh, I didn't play it, but Chris did. Chris Yee is a fan of, of Lacerda games, so he's going to start reviewing them. He'll eventually get around to On Mars, so that's going up today, and you all can be happy and stop yelling at me for not reviewing Lacerda games. Although I reviewed at least two, but anyhow. Um, all right, let's talk about what I found on the internet. I didn't find this. We created this. So we've been doing new things on our, on our channel. We've been doing new series of videos that we're starting and working on. I hope you all enjoy those. But I wanted to bring something back. And uh, with Chris here helping us now, this is something that I put him in charge of. And it's going to hopefully help you all out. Um, Chris is doing a lot of little things behind the scenes. Like, for example, our show notes for our live shows now go up instantaneously, which I hope is helpful. But also we're bringing back Dice Tower audio or Dice Tower video audio. Anyway, what this is, is in podcast form, you can now listen to many of the different um, shows that we do. Like, not, not, every, not every video that we put out, but like top tens, for example, or maybe a board game breakfast or different, or maybe one of our big reviews, like we just did Sleeping Gods, things like that. Well, you can subscribe to the podcast now. You just go to dtvaudio.com. Um, just like it shows here in the picture, and you can then subscribe to the podcast, and then about once a day, maybe maybe twice if there's a lot of videos, but not not all our videos, like I said, you can just listen to them. Now, it's not for some of them, it's not going to be as good of an experience because the lack of visual things you're looking at, but for some things like the top 10 list and such, it might work well for you. So you might not be able to watch everything, but maybe you have something where you can listen to stuff. We've done this in the past. This has been existing for a long time, but I think the last time it had been updated was like January 2020 or something to that effect. And so now it's dedicated. It will be going up all the time. So hopefully you enjoy this. Uh, the <laughs> the, uh, the Dice Tower video audio and again it's not for everybody but it's something that you could subscribe to and just listen to some of the audio things that we put out. So we hope that this is something that helps you all out. Check it out. Tell your friends. Tell your relatives. Let's keep moving. This is a segment where we take a look at a board game based on an IP and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms match or not. Today we're looking at children's game Goosebumps. It's going to be based off of the first movie. Let's take a look and see how it works and I'll come back and tell you if the IP and the mechanisms fit. And what you're going to be doing is racing to get to the end and the first person to get to the end will be the winner of the game. On your turn, it's very easy. You always draw up to five. If you already have five cards, then you simply will draw one card. You can play a card easily for the amount of movement on it. In this case, four. So I play this card and one, two, three, four. Players cannot be on the same spot of the board. You can also play cards of three of a kind, and that will move you to the next landmark. You can see there's landmark spaces throughout. 
In addition, there are a few action cards that can be played, like a Foundry Book, you move ahead six, and the lead player back to the previous landmark. So if you were up here, you can move forward six spots, and whoever's in the lead will go back to the landmark. And you have a few spots here where if you're able to land directly on the shortcut through the graveyard, you just kind of move up, shoot the ladder style, and there is a steal card if you land on this on exact movement, you can steal a card from somebody's hand. First one to the end is your winner. My kids really do like the Goosebump movies. They're kind of good horror-themed clean movies for kids and I think the board game they were a little bit excited about. When my kids saw the board they were like, oh, this is a roll of moves, a spin of moves. I could kind of see that into it. But once they found there was a little bit of hand management to it, I think the game was a little bit elevated from what it could have been. Does the IP fit? Uh, I mean, there's a little bit of R.L. Stein in this. You're playing the bad guys in this, which is a little bit different than what you're doing in the movie. And I think that's a novel, a little bit different. And it has a really neat like Halloween theme to it if you want to play it. At the end of the day, you're really just racing up this track, and there's a little bit of a story attached to it, but not really. So the IP doesn't fit, but I will say the game is better than it could have been. It really looks like a roll and move or a spin and move, and it doesn't do that, which is nice. You have the, you still have the trope of steal a card or play the right card at the right time. You can block certain things, but the collection of cards to move further up, where you're trying to say, I don't want to play those sixes because I want to save them for the three of a kind. That's kind of neat. And game, or you happen to have a kid that's really into goosebumps, this or fit their thing. But everybody else, you won't want to look at this one very much longer. All right, correction real quickly. We were talking about Dice Tower Video Audio. If you want to go to the website quickly, just go to DiceTowerAudio.com. That will take you right to the Libsyn page, which is DTVideo.com slash Libsyn or whatever. Just go to DiceTowerAudio.com. Alrighty, production for this week. What's coming from the Dice Tower over the course of this week? So let me take a look. I already told you Chris was reviewing Kanban. Uh, Z will be doing a What's Happening in just a bit at 10. I'll be doing my Q&A at noon, like I always do. Uh, tomorrow, we're playing Umbravia Live. I hope you enjoy that. Um, I'll be doing my boring unboxing. I'm going to continue my weekly series of five more great games. I hope you guys have been enjoying that. I've had various guests on it tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll have a famous game designer on the channel. Um, my kids and I will be reviewing Sleeping Gods. I know we did it as a uh, all together last week in the four squares, but I also want to get you my kids' opinions of the game. The new expansion for Aquatica, Kohaku, Seven Bridges. Um, we're going to be doing a couple four squares this week, one of Fun Fair and one of Dice Throne Adventures. I'll also be taking a look at Bloodborne. Um, we got podcasts going up. We have, um, Mike's going to be taking a look at Maglev Metro Solo. Um, board Game Breakfast, of course, on Thursday live. Our crowd surfing on Wednesday. And, of course, tomorrow, the most important video we do each week, um, Shoots and Marbles. So come back and join us for that. Lots of live stuff, lots of things. Oh, I think we have another, I'm sorry, we have another playthrough on Friday, too, don't we? We do. And we're going to be playing a game called Shamans. So a couple live plays. Hope you all enjoy that. And that's what's coming this week from the Dice Tower. Let's keep going. Hey guys, it's Deanna. Today I'm going to be talking about another educational game you can play with your kids. And today I'm going to be talking about the game Math Match. Math Match is a game for 1-4 to four players ages 5-12. to 12. To begin the game, 7 cards are placed face up in the center of the table and the remaining cards are put into a draw pile. The first player rolls the two 12-sided target dice. Younger players add the numbers on the dice, and older players will multiply them to get a target number. Then, players use the face-up cards to make an equation. They can add, subtract, multiply, or divide to get as close to the target number as possible. Whoever can get the closest to the target number first wins that round, and the cards they use to create their equation are kept as score points. At the start of the next round, more cards are turned face up until there are seven. Then the next player rolls the dice and play continues for five rounds. At the end of five rounds, players will count up how many cards they have earned. The player with the most is the winner. We've really enjoyed playing Math Match so far. I think it's very similar to Math Dice and Math Dice Junior and that kind of whole set of games. Um, for Math Match, the only big difference is that you're playing with cards in addition to rolling dice. 
So this game is really great. I like that you're able to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That has been really nice for our family because I have kids at various grade levels who are learning um, all of those different math concepts. So I hope that you will check out Math Match if you're looking for an educational math game to play with your kids. That's gonna be it for today. I'll be back next time to share another educational game. I hope you enjoy the rest of Board Game Breakfast. Interestingly enough, I'll be reviewing that game in a few weeks, so stay tuned. I've been playing that with my son. Okay, so Q&A today at noon. One of the questions I get asked almost every week is, how many times you play a game before you review it? Or something, or will you be reviewing something? But I want to talk a little bit about this. We've done a video before where we show the process of a review, which you can look up. It's actually called the same thing, Anatomy of a Review. Uh, I think I did it last year when I took the game Hawaii and walked you through a review of that from beginning to end. But I want to give you some of the thought process for review. We are very clear at this point, I try to be as clear as I can with publishers, that when they send us a game, I always tell them two things. One, we have a huge queue, and two, we don't promise that we'll review a game. And it's important because we get a ton of games. You see my boring unboxings each week. There's more games that come there than we put output in a week. And that's me, Z, Mike, Chris, and everybody else. You know, there's just a lot of games. We just can't get to all of them. But even when we do get to them, how do we do it? I can tell you a very unfun way to do it would be to take the games as they come in and put them in order. And you would have to play through them in the order they came in the mail. And that would mean if a hot new game or dying to play comes in, we'd be like, oh, I guess we'll get to that in, in, in two months or something. So that's not going to happen. So when I'm picking a game to review, I will go and I'll just say, okay, what games do I want to play? So there's, there's several factors that go into that. One is, am I really interested in the game? Yes. Uh, it's going to get to the table as fast as I possibly can. But also, how accessible is the game? I may be dying to play a game, but if it's a six hour game, requires four or five people, that's a harder one to get to the table. If it's a game I can play with my kids, that can get to the table quicker, but also realize I'm getting hundreds of games that I can play with my kids at this point in time. They're just coming in. So what happens is I just, I have piles of games and I just have to make that generalization as to what games I'm gonna play. It's kind of all what I'm feeling. And so I'll pick a game and say, well, try this game. I mean, sometimes it's not hard because the guys will be like, yeah, we're dying to play this game. Let's play it. You know, or other people are interested in playing this game. Uh, for my kids, they'll play pretty much anything I put on the table. But I take home, from work here, I'll take home a pile of games and have them at home. And in fact, this weekend, I finished every game I have at home for my kids. Um, so I was like, huh, so this week, I'm going to load up another 30 games, take them home, and we'll go through those a little bit at a time. But again, it's just kind of what we're in the mood for, what we have time for. And that's not a fair, good way to do it at all, but it's just how it works. And it's kind of a good way for you all. Now, I make the schedule here for the Dice Tower. If you could see the schedule that we have, and we, we use Google Documents, and I make a schedule, and it has all the things, and I spread my reviews throughout a week. I try to do 11 to 12 reviews a week for myself. I don't know where that number came from. I just started it, and that's how it turned out to be. And I try to be as consistent as I possibly can, but not every week reviews can go up, but I hope that you find there's some consistency. But when it comes time to do reviews, I usually try to pick a couple big reviews. So for example, this week, uh, the uh, Bloodborne, that will be a big review, right? A lot of people are interested in Bloodborne. And then I got some, that's like my tier one, that and Dice Throne Adventures. Those are like the tier one games. A lot of people are really interested in those. And then tier two, maybe the Call to Adventure um, game, the Aquatica expansion, and my kids with Sleeping Gods, that, that might be tier two. Then tier three, I fit little games all in and around it because if there's one thing I'm very adamant here with the Dice Tower is I want to make sure we're always taking a look at the smaller little games. Just because we do these big games, we do want to get smaller little games. Now, not every smaller little game and games will slip throughout the cracks. And now I've started doing a... Um, eight negative reviews every so often and sometimes I hate a game a lot or I don't like it and I don't want to put more effort into it 
because we have this many games coming through. So those get shunted off to those, those piles, and they still get talked about, maybe not in a great way, but it happens. So that's kind of my thought process and how I pick the reviews that go out. Now, how about playing them? More work goes into that than people think, and a lot of that work centers in and around the game. I mean, just pulling the game off, and I play and teach games cold for the most part, which would probably drive some people crazy and may actually drive the people I play games with crazy, for which I'm sorry. Um, but I open a rule book. I'm pretty good at reading through the rules pretty fast and learning the game on the spot, but I just do that because of time. But when I'm done playing through the game, however many times I think to get the game, I, I'm not done there. I actually, I kind of format my opinion. This is what I think of the game. And then I go online and I read about the game. I'll read the blurbs in the game. I might watch another review. I don't often watch reviews or read reviews, but I might. And I almost always do that when I have an incredibly strong opinion on a game. Like if I think the game is amazing or if I hate the game with all my heart. I almost always look at other people's opinions, especially when I hate the game, because I want to know if there's something I'm missing. I want to know how can people possibly like this game. I will always read the comments on Board Game Geek. Unfortunately, sometimes the games I review are so new that I want the first people to have them. But if not, I go read through the comments. Uh, if it has a Kickstarter, which nowadays is more and more likely, I go look at that. I always read the rules again before I do a review. In fact, I do a more thorough reading of the rules before I do a review than I do before playing the game. But that's just because, and there have been times where I pulled the game out, went through the rules carefully, and I was like, oh, hang on, we're not reviewing this yet because we might have done something wrong. That has happened in the past. But there's a lot of, of thought patterns that go into that. And then I, we here at the Dice Tower, if someone else likes the game way more than me, I might say, you review it. I, I, I'd rather have the person who likes it the most review it. That just makes sense. But sometimes I think the game is big enough that it gets a four squares review. Now that's also tricky because we need four people to play a game. Uh, for it to get a four squares review and all four people want some modicum of understanding the game back and forth But I think you get the most diverse opinions there So that's that's how I get into the mode to prepare to review the game um, I'll, I sometimes I'll get a game out. I'll look at it um, Like I said, I read a lot of other people's opinions not so that I can steal their opinions or anything But it like it gives me a better idea of how I can shape my own opinions about the game I don't want and also, again, if there's something glaring, if everyone says, we had a problem with this, I'll think, well, let me go look at that. Did I have a problem with it? Yes. Why or why not? And someone says, this is amazing, and I think it's not. Why or why not? So that's a little bit about how I think and prepare for a review. I'll talk a little bit more about the actual process of doing the review next week. So there you go. Let's keep moving. Hey folks, welcome back to my Board Game Breakfast segment. I am Anthony from Board Game Dads, and this is AJ. AJ, say hello. Hello. I'm going back and doing some older Favorite Game Friday picks, something I've never done before, so I'm going to rattle off a bunch more today. First up is Trick Taking Game. I really dice like... Dice Tower. Yes, we're on the Dice Tower. Dice Tower. I really like the Dwarf King. It's a fun twist on Trick Taking. Check that out if you've never seen it before. Favorite Miniatures Game. I don't have a whole lot of these, um, so I'm going to go with an older game, Shadows Over Camelot. Some cool miniatures in there. Next up is favorite older game. I have to go with Catan. I've just taught that to so many people over the years. Uh, next up, we've got best cover art. Mountains of Madness just drew me in with that cover art. Uh, really want it, made me want to know what that game was about. Uh, next up, a game that I think is spooky. I'm going to go with Horrified. That gets a lot of play these days. Love the cooperative aspect and different monsters in there. Next up, we've got a game I warmed up to. This would be Carcassonne. I did not like Carcassonne at first. Every time I played that game, my friend who taught it to me had a new expansion. And so I was always like a few steps behind on learning what these new things did. So it took me a while to kind of get my head around Carcassonne, but I like it a lot now. One of my favorites, of course. And next up, we've got a game with a unique mechanism. I like uh, the game Mystic Market for this pick. It has a, a varying market value based on these potion bottles that you actually have in the game that fall down this little track and thus uh, alter their, their market value. It's pretty cool. Uh, next up, favorite game with randomness. I gotta go with the dice game here, so I'm gonna go with Zombie Dice, another push your luck Yahtzee style game with uh, some brains that you're trying to collect there. Uh, next up, we've got favorite game that requires skill. 
Uh, I think Summon Wars is a good two versus, or sorry, one-on-one, -on -one, two-player game uh, that does involve a lot of skill because every faction plays really, really different. AJ, you want to come say goodbye real quick since time's up? Come on, come on, come on. Come here. Come here. Say bye-bye, Dice Tower. Bye, Dice Tower. See you later. Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from the Family Showdown. On this episode of By the Numbers, we're continuing my Through the Years series, where we look at the best game on Board Game Geek by year. We started with 1970, this time 2007. Take a look at the top five. We see the number one game from 2007 is Brass, or as the kids are calling it these days, Brass Lancashire, coming in at number 19. Brass is an economic strategy game set in northwest England, the Lancashire area, during the Industrial Revolution. Brass got a fancy new reboot in 2018 by Roxley Games. It updated the artwork, the graphic design, the components, and changed a few little rules. In fact, I've never played the original version of Brass. I have the shiny new Roxley edition to the game. And in fact, I got the cool new poker chips. Let's take a look. I went crazy all in for the recent Roxley game Kickstarter for their Iron Clays. I went for the crazy big giant box of goodness, which has 400 of these iron clay chips that are really amazing. They're really cool. They sound like real, like fancy poker chips. Um, this is really overboard for brass. You don't really need this much stuff, but I use these chips for a lot of games, especially my 18xx games. Technically, the ratings over 19,000 of them. We see lots of 8s and 9s and 7s and 10s for overall rating of 8.2. Technically, the weight it comes in at a 3.86, which is about right for what would many consider a very heavy economic Euro game. So if you want to try a heavy economic strategy game that's all that and a stack of chips, Brass and Lancashire might be the game for you. See you next time. I have stopped pretty much drinking anything other than water at this point. I drink, you know, the occasional other thing, but I like flavoring in my water. So when Mia was invented, I don't know, when this, this started, like, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I thought it was amazing. They had multiple flavors, and mixing powder in drinks is a real pain in the neck. Mixing these water droplets in is fantastic. And you can see here is the Walmart version the great value. Now, I wanted to talk about this because this is something I feel very strongly about, and if you, this is like, I have all these here at the studio. That's that's a lot, but I like variety of flavors, and I like to do different things, and I would th talk about these. I'm not talking about specific flavors um, per se, but you know, there's Mio, and then there's Mio, Mio Vitamins and Mio Energy. I would like to say I don't think the Mio Energy ever provides me with energy. I don't feel like it does anything at all. So I'm looking for flavors, and I tend to personally prefer fruit flavors, which is why I have, like, this blue raspberry or black cherry here. These bigger ones are good. So those are the normal ones. Let's talk about ones that you may not have heard of, and I'll give you my opinions on them. So here we have H2 Wow, which is a terrible name. And this stuff is okay at best. This is cucumber, lemongrass, and lime ginger. Now, if those sound like that's what they taste like, they do. So if you want to be all fancy and cool, or you like drinking the hotel water when you go to a five-star hotel, then this is what you get. Um, I will mix these with something else. Like I might take some cherry and then stick in some lime ginger, one squirt of that. So they're okay. Also in the okay healing here, we have monk fruit. Old-fashioned lemonade. I don't know how that fits with monks. I didn't know monks were making old-fashioned lemonade or strawberry guava. But again, this has almost too highfalutin of a taste to it. So I'm not sure these are ones that I want to get too often. Then we have this stuff here is sweet leaf water drops. I just I'm just trying all kinds of stuff. They're they're okay. Uh, where's another one of those? Here we go. We got strawberry kiwi, peach mango. Got some flavors of this. These are fine, but they're not as good as, again, Mio. So far, everything I've showed you, in my opinion, is not as good as straight Mio. Mio's the, the flavor that I kind of put in the middle. The next ones are a little weird. I think these are actually made for, like, 
tea or coffee. We got coconut, chocolate, caramel, and vanilla. So there's a sweetener mixed with flavor. So you put these in coffee or hot chocolate or what have you. However, if you mix the vanilla with, let's say, blue raspberry, then you have blue raspberry vanilla. Or if you mix it with cherry, cherry vanilla, and I'm not kidding, that's a fantastic drink. You could even mix the cherry with the chocolate, and it's not, it, the chocolate is definitely a fake chocolatey flavor, but I don't know. These have like a dual purpose though. Like I said, you can use them in hot drinks, and that's probably what they're intended for. But all right, now we have Tang. Now, if you're like me, you grew up in the 80s, you know, and I grew up in the 80s, Tang was it. Tang is a fantastic drink. I don't care who it was created for. It's better here on Earth than it is in space. But I just, I like the flavor of Tang. This is not as good as Tang, in my opinion. This is okay. It's a, it's a nice flavor, but I wouldn't argue and say it's fantastic. But now we're going to go to the fantastic ones. Here we go. Kool-Aid. Come on. Come on, Kool-Aid, and I don't even have regrets like I would after drinking all that sugar. I like Kool-Aid, and this says zero calories. So Kool-Aid flavors, now they're not amazing, and um, but they're good, and they're not the best, though. There's better than that. Now we have Starburst. I know. I didn't know these existed. You probably didn't either until you saw this. They taste like Starburst. I'm not kidding here. They're good. Yeah, I don't know that I want to drink Starburst all the time, and it feels embarrassing, but I like them. They're good, but they're not as good as Icy's. These things are amazing. I buy these in bulk. I drink them that much. They come in cherry and blue raspberry. I think they're the only two flavors, but I'm a big fan of drinking Icy's when I was a kid, and so these, if you like fruit like me, these are some of the best, but we're not done yet because better than them is Crush. I was really surprised how much I like these. Orange Crush and Strawberry Crush, and I think there's a Grape Crush too. They're just good. Like if I want a straight orange drink, this is bug juice, folks. And again, with very few calories, so I like them. But my favorite, better than anything else for me, are the Jelly Belly ones. And again, I'm a big fan of fruit, so that has something to do with it. So we got Green Apple, Berry Blue, Berry Cherry, and Tutti Frutti. All good jelly beans. And the Tutti Frutti actually is my favorite of the bunch, which is weird because it's not my favorite jelly bean. I would pick any of these three over it. Green apple's pretty, I mean, they're all solid. I really like these, but the jelly bellies. And, the, and again, I like all this stuff because it's pretty much guilt free too. And it just gives you lots of different things. And you can mix them together. I can have cherry green apple, or like I said, very cherry chocolate, or Orange chocolate, that doesn't work. But orange cherry, you can make flavors and mix them together, it's fantastic. Anyway, that's what I think. If there's one I missed that you think is worth me talking about, and don't even try to point me to that skinny girl flavor kind, because if there's anyone who's the opposite of a skinny girl, that's me, and that stuff tasted horrible. But if you know what I'm missing, let me know, because I want to try out new ones. All right, let's keep moving. Hi, I'm Ambie, and today I'm gonna talk about Black Sonata, which is a solo deduction game about finding the dark lady from Shakespeare's sonnets. In the game, there's a map of different spaces, and each turn, the lady is going to move one space. You don't know where she is. And each turn, you can move one space or search in the space you're in for the lady. The lady's movement is determined by a deck of cards that has symbols of possible places she could be. And once you search for her, you cannot search in that same place again because you replace the card with a fog card, which means her movements are hidden. You're going to be going through this deck multiple times in the game, so as the game progresses, there's a memory aspect because she'll be going through the same path again and you'll have to remember where she went in order to catch her, since you can only move once each turn and you have to be on her space in order to catch her. Once you successfully find her, you get a clue card and you'll need multiple clue cards in order to actually determine her identity, which is the final goal of the game. This adds another layer of deduction to the game. Each clue card has three traits, and the hidden dark lady also has three traits. So each clue card has a number saying how many traits match with theirs and the hidden dark lady that you're supposed to figure out. As you get more clue cards, after each time you find the dark lady, the deck goes more spaces, so she moves further away and it gets harder to catch her again. So you want to try to catch her and find out her identity in as few clue cards as possible. 
It's very clever how this game works solo without needing anyone to tell you the movements because of how the deck works and the clue cards work. And there's a lot of variations in the setup with different movement options for the Dark Lady, so there's a lot of replayability in the game. Overall, Black Sonata is a great solo hidden movement and deduction game that you should definitely try out if you like deduction games. Bye! Hey, I'm Grant with Grant's Game Rex, and today I want to recommend a game about getting on the same wavelength called... Boy, I really hope you guys said wavelength at home, because like this whole point of this game is getting on the same wavelength as other people, and if you said wavelength when I did that like dramatic pause, that would mean we're on the same wavelength, and that'd be a pretty cool start to this video. In Wavelength, you'll have a spectrum, smelly in a bad way to smelly in a good way, then one member of your team will spin this dial and secretly look at where the dial landed. They have to give a clue to their teammates to try to get them to point this in the right direction. So for instance, if it was over here, smelly in a bad way, my clue might be skunk. If it was over here, smelly in a good way, my clue might be roses. And if it was here in the middle, smelly in a middle way, I might say myself. Wavelength is one of my top 10 party games of all time because it's really fun, which is obviously a prerequisite to being a great party game. But more than that, this sparks memorable and funny debates. For instance, if this is where my uh, dial landed and my, my spectrum was art to not art, maybe my clue is like Thomas Kincaid. And now I have to sit there as everybody else debates, like, well, I don't know. I mean, Thomas Kincaid technically is art. It's bad art, but it counts as art. Somebody else is like, well, I don't like it. It's terrible art. I'd rather look at a litter box than a Thomas Kincaid painting. And somebody else is like, what does it matter what you'd rather look at, dude? Grant's the one giving the clue. What does he think? And somebody else is like, well, I don't know. Grant's got bad taste. Maybe he thinks Thomas Kincaid is fine art. And I just have to sit here like, don't you, don't you say that about me. I do not think Thomas Kincaid is fine art. Don't give it a Away, but don't you put me in that category. What is your problem? Thomas Kincaid is fine art. Fine art. I don't think it's great art, but it's fine art, and I would I would have a Thomas Kincaid hanging on my wall. So whatever. I'd put it at least 75% good art. It's better than I better be careful. <laughs> I will not repeat. I will not finish that sentence. I'll get in trouble. Well, folks, that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Don't forget, in 23 minutes, Z is going live with What's Happening. So I don't actually know what the game is. So you'll have to come online and see what it is and join him. Does it say here on our schedule? Nope. So it's a surprise to everybody. Um, so come watch that. I'll be back at noon for Q&A. And, and we got other stuff going up all week long. So we hope to see you. We hope to have a good time. Thank you, everybody, for watching our show. Thank you to the amazing contributors. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.